all who enter herein and upon the whole family of humankind. Peace of eternal love, peace of joyful hope, peace of wellness for all creatures, peace, peace, peace. We need you now in our hearts, in our homes, in our communities, in this world. We beckon you, sacred spirit, heed our heart's longings for peace in this space, that we might hold you close these moments and take you back with us out into this world. Let's continue to gather the spirit of the community by rising in body or spirit to join in singing our opening hymn number 256, Winter Night. Opening words come to us this morning by Jalaluddin Rumi. They are entitled The Guest House. <clears throat> this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a desperation, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond.
of Muhammad. The infant was born in the spring of the year 570 in the town of Mecca, a mountain town in the high desert plateau of Western Arabia. He was the first and only son of Abdallah bin Muttalib and Amin bin Wahab. Abdallah died before his son was born and Amina named their son Muhammad, an unusual name at the time, which comes from the Arabic word hamada, meaning to praise, to glorify. Some stories report that a great light came forward from Amina when Muhammad was born, and that the light reached so far as to light the palaces of Syria. Others report that the sacred fire of the Meiji, the Zoroastrian fire temples, died down at the moment of his birth, that the pillars of the sacred palaces of Kisra shook, and the churches around Lake Sawa collapsed. Amina followed a practice that was common in Mecca, which was to send babies to be nursed by Bedouin tribeswomen and be raised in the hill country where they could grow strong in the fresh, clean air, learn pure Arabic of the tribe people, and most of all, be trained in their good manners. Meccans believed that the Bedouins were naturally resistant to the vices of the city and that their children would be more virtuous if they were raised in the tribal ways. The Bedouin mother who adopted Muhammad was named Halima, and there were many stories of the good fortune that befell her as soon as Muhammad came into her life. She had been a little reluctant to take him, actually, because there was a terrible drought in the countryside, and she and her family were starving. She wasn't sure she'd have enough milk for him, and he didn't even have a father to provide payment to her. But she took him home and fed him, and found that suddenly she had plenty of milk for both he and his foster brother. And when her husband went out to milk their starving goat, the goat who had been terribly sick suddenly produced milk enough for the family to sell. The whole land around them that had been barren turned fertile, and the animals who had been starving grew fat and flourished. When Muhammad was five or six, after he returned to his mother, Amina, she took him to Yathrib, an oasis town a few hundred miles north of Mecca, to stay with relatives and visit his father's grave. On the return journey, Amina took ill and died. Halima, his nurse, returned to Mecca with the orphan boy and placed him in the protection of his paternal uncle, a uh, grandfather, Abdul al-Muttalib. His grandfather passed away just a couple of years later in 578, when Muhammad was only eight, and he was then passed into the care of his paternal uncle, Abdul Talib. Muhammad grew up in the older man's home and remained under Abu Talib's protection for many years. It is hard to imagine what it must have looked like for Muhammad to live such a disrupted childhood, filled with so much loss. As it says in the Quran, did God not find you an orphan and give you shelter and care? And he found you wandering and gave you guidance. And he found you in need and he made you independent. In just a few moments, we are going to sing our children out to their third through sixth grade classes. But before we do that, we wanted to come together in prayer, and I was hoping that everyone could take the hand of their neighbor while we pray this morning. <clears throat> It doesn't have to be across the aisle. <laughs> Let us pray. Source of hope, spirit of life, God of many names and one limitless love. We give thanks that in this sometimes scary and heartbreaking world, we have one another in this space and time, in this peace and fellowship. 
as we mourn with those in Newtown, Connecticut after Friday's tragedy and with an entire nation all too familiar with this grief. As we pray for safety and protection for our own children and families, show us the immense power of your goodness. There are no guarantees that this life will be easy. Our lives are shaped by loss and suffering, just as they are by love and wisdom, mercy and grace. And yet, in the midst of every loss, emerge the helpers, the faithful and brave and caring people of this world, with arms to comfort, hands to heal, mouths to pray, and strength to lean on. Remind us of all the faithful and brave and caring people in this church who are always ready when we are in need, with comforting arms and healing hands, with praying mouths and sustaining strength, embodying, making real for us none other than the love of God. Help us to remember that though the darkness of winter and suffering might overwhelm us, the light, your light, our light, shines even in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. These things we pray for love's sake. Amen. As St. Augustine has said, to sing is to play, pray twice. And so we sing our children out and invite them to stay with us through a couple of verses of this song before leaving on the third. Salam Alaikum. decided last summer to share the birth narratives of different world religious leaders during Advent, we were thinking, what a great opportunity for comparative religion, broadening our minds and hearts to embrace the less familiar stories as we walk in the midst of the Jesus story our faith is rooted in. And we've seen in the stories what appears to be a broadly shared human urge to find a very special someone. Whether you call it God made flesh, a human who has achieved special status, a prophet, or a teacher. Someone who is capable of guiding us out of this world of pain and heartbreak. And the other thing that's beautiful and charming and poignant about all of the stories that we've heard is in fact, that all of the births involve children in some way in great peril. The Buddha was the only one of the leaders who was born into great wealth. Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, all were of humble means and troubled early lives. Moses and Jesus born under threat of death. Muhammad practically doomed by being born without a father. 
So today, I was going to explore the fact that these teachers' lives were all about risking their own precious selves for the sake of experience, compassion, justice, obedience to God or to the deepest in them. I thought, what a great lesson for parents in our time and non-parents as well in this culture that makes safety an idol and tries to assess risk down to the most minute probability in order to avoid it. It was on its way to being a pretty amazing sermon. And then Friday morning's news came of the events at Sandy Hook Elementary School. You all know the story probably better than you want to by now. And after the news came, and after I laid my arms and eyes on my own children that afternoon, I found myself deep in the kind of yearning we talk about every year at this time, but I at least have never felt so profoundly. My prophetic call to uh, change the way we look at the world suddenly dissolved in my desire to find just the right size of bubble wrap to wrap around those children and make sure that they never felt harm in this world. But my impulse was also that I wanted a prophet, a real prophet. I wanted to see and hear from someone who had heard God's voice loud and clear and wasn't going to shut up until some other folks heard it too. I wanted trustworthy confirmation that there is indeed a holy being out there who weeps at the sight of what we do to each other, sees the suffering that we endure. My spirit demanded an audience with someone who had gotten true and direct confirmation that would get us out of this mess. If the angel Gabriel was involved, so much the better. As a good Unitarian Universalist, I appreciate and regularly celebrate the fact that our faith is grounded in reason, but reason was not the least bit satisfying. I believe in political activism, too, and I'm convinced that we need more gun control and greater access to mental health care. But the pleas for those, too, were not enough for my troubled soul. I'm often soothed by information, by the perspective that only solid data can bring. And though I was grateful for the calm and rational tones of the statistician on NPR who reminded listeners yesterday that most children who die do not die from school rampage shootings, I found little solace there. So of course there was prayer, right? My usual Advent spiritual practice that dwells in the land of peaceful wondering, what do you hope to see born in your life, in the world, in this season? I ask it earnestly every year and mean it. I sit with the question in my own prayer life and preach about it from this pulpit, and I welcome the season's invitation to dwell at a slower pace. But as that news came on Friday, I realized in my bones for the first time what this season means to messianic thinkers, the folks who believe in a more willful and more personified God than I usually entertain. Advent for many Christians, is an anticipation of the return of the Christ, the active presence on earth of God made flesh. All at once, that yearning and that hope were real and understandable to me in a whole new way. I wasn't able to dwell just metaphorically in the hope for the return of the light, the arrival of hope. I wanted it in tangible form now. A prophet, a savior, whatever you want to call it, just now, or preferably several days ago, before this bloodshed was unleashed. I still believe that good, the mysterious and benevolent force I call God, can and does work through all of us if we make space for it to do so. I can certainly celebrate all of the ways that God's present in the midst of such a tragedy, in that quotation from Fred Rogers that was floating around the internet, that if we look to the helpers, we do, in fact, see God's presence among us. And there are certainly more of them than there are troubled young men in this world. Thanks be to God. That is a very, very good thing. There is some comfort, some saving grace in that presence of God and goodness flowing in and through us in the midst of all of this. And still, it can feel too small, 
too fragile, too vulnerable to meet the force of such a loss or make whole all that's broken in the world. Though Friday's tragedy is headline-grabbing news because of the magnitude and true senselessness of the violence, our friends at the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute can testify to the fact that children die one by one to violence year in and year out, right here in Boston, without fanfare. And still more are subject to abuse and neglect and hunger and illness. And if we reach further than our own nation, the death toll climbs impossibly great. Families in Egypt, in Syria, in Gaza, Families without enough food or proper shelter or clean water are all around the world, unnamed. So that yearning for a savior, for a prophet, a great person who can tell us it's going to be okay, even if it might take some shaking up of the world to make it so, offers two kinds of comfort. One, that there is indeed something, someone out there far beyond anything we can comprehend that's looking out for us, that sees us and holds us and knows us. And second, it lets us admit our own powerlessness over all that make this possible. And honestly, right in that moment of shock and sadness, I was a sucker for both. And in the midst of that yearning for deliverance, I realized that there must be some middle place, too. The stories of the prophets being rooted in the pain of this world might just be a place to start. After the losses of his childhood, Muhammad went on to come of age as a merchant in a land plagued by intertribal violence. Rival gods and belief systems put whole peoples at risk and kept the land of the Arabian Peninsula at war. The God who spoke through him offered a way of peace, a way of respect for many faiths to come together, a path of discipline and honor that could hold them all. And in our Unitarian telling of the Christmas story, we repeat each year that God Pure goodness was made flesh in the person of Jesus, just as it has been made possible in all of us. Embedded in our birth story, too, is the miracle of our survival. And in the stories of our lives, we have shown the ways that we can and have opened ourselves to heartbreak, to disappointment, sometimes even persecution for what we know to be true. For the, good, for the sake of that good that we know exists. We don't always know within the lifetime of any prophet what the legacy will be, whose story will be embellished with flying elephants or visiting angels or wandering magi. It may be that in those moments when we are most yearning for deliverance from beyond, when we wish for a swift, strong hand to give a good slap to the world and whip it into shape, that our hearts must also be open to receive the depth of the call for each of us to be that prophet, for each of us to take part in redeeming the brokenness of the world, for each of the, us to bear that love that gave us birth in bigger, more creative, more generous ways. If our only job is to wait for that savior from beyond, the prophet from on high, we can also lose hope in our own lives and their meaning. We need that middle place that gives us power and reminds us of our need. We need to save and need, we need to be saved, but we also need to do some saving. So in the midst of these events that grab our collective attention, there's an opportunity to do what can't be done as we absorb the sufferings that we hear about singly. That is, to realize how deeply, how truly we are connected, how bound together our fates really are, how each of us can be agents of healing power, of goodness that might individually not feel like enough, but harnessed together 
could in fact save us. That greater deliverance, that God with us, might indeed come by binding together more carefully the goodness that rests in each of us, by turning to each other in love, in hope, in grief, walking together into the new world that might come if we lived daily with that reminder, if we never let ourselves become too distant from it. In this time of Advent, this time of waiting, it is not yet, in fact, a time of action, but a time of opening our hearts, of dwelling deeply with what is, all that we find there, all that we find in each other. And so let us enter into prayer as we have this whole month with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I invite us to sing it very earnestly as a prayer this morning adding a verse written by our own Dottie Pitt, which is printed in your order of worship. 